Welcome back to the Actuality Podcast. In episode three, prepare to join Jacob on a thrilling new adventure as he embarks on another daring experiment with the projection machine. Grab your headphones and get ready for another riveting installment of the Actuality Podcast. The lecturer's voice thrummed in the back of Jacob's head. He had no mind to pay attention to the lesson, as his thoughts were somewhere else completely. Some of the lesson was still absorbed, but not as much as he would have liked. His regular day classes started several days ago, but even when he was busy with other classes that he enjoyed, every waking moment he spent excited to attend the next class with Professor Melbourne. His thoughts often crossed over the possibilities of the projection machine. He hadn't thought about it that night, but he had done it. He had accessed his memories. As he looked at his timer, he wondered now how easily he could move to the next step project his memories through space and achieve time travel through the FTL methods Professor Melbourne had previously mentioned. The possibilities became more real to him every day, and he began debating about trying it by himself. Then a plan began forming and clicked together in his mind. Everything around Jacob seemed to go silent while his thoughts raced, thinking of all the possibilities that the machine opened up to him. After a bit of thought, he decided that he would enter the lab alone that night and conduct his own experiment solely for the purpose of indulging his own curiosity. He wanted to find out whether he could travel through time as easily as he suspected he could. Jacob knew ahead of time that the lab went unused for the entire day. Of course, no classes had been scheduled for the night either, so it was the perfect time for him to give the machine a go without supervision. It was roughly 1 a.m. when Jacob entered the building and crept down the hallway in the direction of the lab. He was far from stealthy, but the only sound was of his movement, and the silence of the surrounding room was pressed in against him. Jacob neared the lab with his heart slamming inside his chest and curled his hand around the door handle. He was more than a little surprised to find it open, and he had taken precautionary measures to ensure there would be another way in if the door had been locked when he arrived. He pushed the door open, standing in the frame and looking inside the room. Before he stepped in, Jacob wondered whether the professor was too trusting of people or if the door being open was a simple mistake. His question was answered when he saw a janitorial worker exit a room down the hall. He slid silently into the lab. Conscious of the loud click the door made as it closed behind him, he locked the door from inside. The only bit of light inside the room was what came in from beneath the door and the hints of moonlight which came from small cracks between the blinds covering the windows. Jacob pulled his phone from his pocket and used the bit of light it provided to navigate his way through the lab, though there was little for him to navigate around. The projection machine stood eerily in the back of the room, the shadow of the chair atop the platform looming over him as he moved closer. Jacob ignored the chair at first and went straight to the desk that held the computer used to control it. The machine was on. He had a little bit of trouble finding the program that managed the Dawn simulator, and wasted a bit of time looking through the basic projection dashboard. With a few manual searches, though, he found it. But because of the delay, he was feeling more nervous than ever about being alone in the lab. He set the dawn simulator to wake him up for 6.30 a.m., and remembering seeing Professor Melbourne's selections, he looked through all of the settings that were available for the projection machine. There conveniently was one available for him to turn off the recording, and he did. Just to save himself the time later, where he'd have to find the recording and delete it so no one knew he'd been there. Without further ado, Jacob turned off the monitor to eliminate the glaring light and sat himself down on the chair of the machine. He prepped the headpiece and pulled the helmet snug over his head and laid down to try and sleep. Sleep was not something that Jacob found easily that night. The memory Jacob focused on as he became aware of his body's sleeping state was clear in his mind. Walls and other structures inside the building formed as he came to, and his mind registered where he wanted to go. The familiar walls of his old elementary school grew around him. He took a moment to admire how familiar everything looked, but soon thought better than to waste time. Who knew how much time he would have before he woke up? He walked through the empty hallways of the school, the classrooms around him containing groups of parents and students attending the parent-teacher conferences. Jacob looked to find his younger self somewhere within the building, and he knew exactly where he'd be. I want to be a race car driver, he heard his younger self say. Jacob stopped outside his old classroom and waited for the right moment. Oh, honey, you could be a race car driver, but how about doing something better, like...
becoming a doctor, maybe? He knew already that his younger self wouldn't appreciate the suggestion, and in response he said something that younger Jacob couldn't hear through the wall. From what he could tell, there weren't any teachers in the classroom at the moment. He took that as his chance to act on his plan. Walking casually into the classroom, his foster parents immediately saw him and looked at him in confusion. Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Olson. I'm Mr. Everin's assistant. I just wanted to stop by for a moment to tell you about his recommendation for Jacob. Recommendations? Mr. Eberins is the school's piano teacher. Your son is quite the exceptional student, and we're hoping you'd be interested in entering Jacob into full-time lessons outside of school. He then knelt down to look at his younger self. Hey, buddy. You like piano, right? You have the potential to be such a great pianist. Jacob smiled, but his younger self looked at him in confusion. His younger self knew that he'd never had a class with Jacob before, but thankfully he kept his mouth shut. The older Jacob rubbed his younger self's head and stood back up to face his parents. I hope you'll consider it. Mr. Evans is just down the hall at the moment if you have any questions for him. I'm sure he'd be more than willing to answer any that you have. Unfortunately, I've got to leave the school for some business that came up and regrettably I can't assist you right now. Thank you for letting us know. We'll be sure to talk to him before we leave. Anytime. Have a good day. Jacob said, then left the room. He closed the door as he left and pressed his back into the wall after taking a few steps away from the door. His heartbeat was quicker than he'd realized, and he was surprised how well he'd been able to pull it off. He was sure he'd been able to convince his parents that he was telling the truth. Jacob remained against the wall while he tried to calm down. His heart skipped a beat when the classroom door opened again his parents and younger self coming out. Relieved they hadn't seen him, he turned the other way to make route toward the music room where the piano teacher would be. Against his better judgment, Jacob waited a moment and then followed behind them. His father remained silent, but Gene and his younger self spoke back and forth about school and any other childish remarks they could think to make. He paused as they turned into the music room, and then he snuck closer and pressed his body against the door to listen to the conversation inside. Mr. Evans? Yes? We were told by your assistant that you recommended that our son Jacob take out-of-class piano lessons. <laughs> well, that's all fine and dandy, but I don't have an assistant. Wait, what? Some young man just spoke to us in another classroom about how great Jacob is and about your suggestion. There's no doubt about the fact that the little man is a fine student, but I've made no recommendation. Of course, I wouldn't hold someone back from taking lessons if they wanted to. Jacob is a great kid, after all. Jacob waited around until he knew that his foster mother, Jean, would see to it that his younger self took lessons. He decided that it would be best to leave then, as it was wise to avoid any further confrontations with anyone at the school. He made his way down the hallway, but everything around him began to fade away. It hadn't felt like much time had passed, but the light that spread around him could not be mistaken for anything else. Before he knew it, everything around him was gone, and he no longer existed within the memory. A bright light pushed through Jacob's eyelids and he found himself awakening from the dawn simulator. He blinked as he woke up, and then squinted when the light began to blind him in the most annoying fashion. He moved to pull the helmet off along with all of the straps that were around his head. He stood up and stretched, not really feeling well rested at all. In fact, he probably could have said he was exhausted, but overall he did not feel noticeably different. Jacob knew he would have to find out for himself whether his experiment worked or not. He picked up all of his things, stuffed it all into his backpack and slung it over his shoulder. After double checking that there was no recording on the computer and that everything was left as it was the previous night, he left for his morning class. He sat in the lecture hall doodling in his notebook while he fought the same problem that he encountered the previous day in class. He couldn't get his mind off of the projection machine long enough to focus. Though that day his thoughts were more specific. He was thinking about the previous night's events. Jacob was much too curious whether it had worked or not. After a while of being in class, he realized that he hadn't been taking any notes for the lecture. With a sigh, he examined the doodles that he'd been drawing some surprisingly detailed sketches of Zoe. He silently laughed at himself in a flip to the next page, intending to take notes. He found that he couldn't even force himself to focus on his class. Instead, his mind constantly wandered back 
to the memory projection. He recalled everything perfectly, but he figured that was partially because he had only woken up about an hour ago and hadn't thought about much else since. Jacob began writing about his experience in the projection. He recorded detailed notes on all of his observations and thoughts. Before he knew it, he had several pages written about the single memory, and his class was already over. Though the details of his time in the memory weren't quite as fresh in his mind anymore, he no longer solely focused on it either. His mind had cleared a bit, and he was able to think about other things. But now that the class was over, only one thing mattered. Did it work? He didn't have a clue where the musical arts facilities were before he needed them, so he had to take a little extra time to find out where they were. Once he discovered that they were directly opposite of the science building, it was smooth sailing from then on. It took Jacob some time to navigate around the buildings themselves, as the halls and rooms inside the music buildings were fairly busy. There were lots of students lugging around instruments as they passed by, some going in and out of classrooms or individual practice rooms. He found the larger communal practice rooms with the assistance of the signs on the walls. There was only one room that was completely empty, and it had a gorgeous grand piano sitting in the middle of it. He pushed the door open and went inside, seeing that the walls on either side were connected to the neighboring rooms by a pane of glass. The room next to him was filled with quite a few other students, and he could hear their chattering through the glass. The piano itself was intimidating, and he stood at the door and stared at it before he even made any attempt to get closer. For some reason, the instrument still seemed so foreign to him, and his doubts on Professor Melbourne's theory about changes taking effect really began to sink in. He sat down on a not-so-comfortable seat and ran his fingers lightly over the keys. He avoided pressing any of them hard enough for the instrument to react with a noise as he was just trying to get a feel for the piano itself. When he finally pushed his fingers into one of the keys, he found that the noise was somewhat familiar, kind of like a distant relative he may have met once or twice when he was younger but hadn't seen since. Well, he was there now, so he might as well try everything he could think of. Perhaps he just needed to warm up first, so that's what he tried to do. He ran his hands along the keys, but realized after a minute that he was just picking keys at random and hoping for music. In all, his efforts were fruitless. He doubted the success of his experiment and thought about everything that could have possibly gone wrong. He picked up some of the sheets of music that were resting on the top of the grand piano. He scanned the sheets carefully. He could sort of read the notes on the paper. He knew what the notes said, but looking down at the piano, he wasn't sure which notes went where. His heart raced, and he could hear blood rushing through his ears. He was getting excited, and he thought he was on to something. He propped the sheet of music up against the lid of the piano where he could read it, and with a deep breath he tried to play. He failed at first, running his fingers along the keys. It felt awkward. He stumbled more than a dozen times while he tried to figure out which keys were which. But overall it sounded horrible, and he physically cringed while he attempted to play. But it was his first try. He couldn't get it right on his first try. He'd never played piano in his life. What he recognized, though, was some of the sounds that the keys made. Carefully he tapped them one at a time, letting each note consume his hearing. Each note echoed around him, and soon enough he pulled memories from his brain that he didn't know existed. The memories consisted of piano lessons when he was a child. Patterns of notes and sounds overwhelmed him, jutting against his already formed memories and giving him the knowledge he needed in order to play. Soon he found that he could identify each key and associate them with the notes on the paper, but only after several painful processes of trial and error. He took another deep breath once he was sure all of the notes were locked into his brain. He wasn't yet confident that it would work, but he felt that his next attempt would be better than all of the previous ones. His hands ran across the piano keys, his eyes darting back and forth between them and the sheet music that told him what to play. The music flowed through his hands and into his fingers like a second language, one that he was still learning and was not good at. He moved on to a bunch of different songs, picking up on his mistakes and correcting them by listening to each of the notes he played, and soon he was amazed at the fact that he was able to play the instrument so fluently. It wasn't long before Jacob decided he should try something harder, something that wasn't child's play like all of the other songs he'd been trying. He flipped through several songs, picking ones that appeared to be different degrees of difficulty. He played them without any large problems, 
Mistakes here and there were inevitable, and he tried not to let that bother him. Eventually, he turned to the end of the book, where he found a song that looked like a scary mixture of notes he was unsure of his ability to play. To him, it seemed like the perfect song on which to test his actual ability. Stretching his hands, he placed them in the correct positions and began to play. The song went well, but there were more than a few mistakes. Almost a half hour later, the song was done. Jacob was breathless, and as he moved to get up from the piano, the rooms around him erupted in applause. The noise startled him for a moment as he wasn't aware that anyone was watching him. He looked at those who stared at him through the glass. He gave them a nervous smile. Then his eyes met with Zoe's in the room next to him. She offered him a smile in return, and after a moment, she got up to leave the room. He was after her in mere seconds. He darted out of the room and found her waiting in the hall by the room he was playing in. Zoe. I didn't know you played the piano. Jacob laughed and scratched his head. I, uh, it had been played in a while. Today was just one of those days when I was just itching to play. Oh, I see. Well, what are you up to right now? I was just going to go grab a bite. I'd love to hear more about what got you started playing the piano, especially something so complicated. I mean, you think you know a person. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. The two of them began walking out of the school, spaced far enough from each other as they moved to make Jacob not feel so uncomfortable to be walking with and talking to his crush. Zoe lifted an eyebrow, turning her head in his direction as they walked. You're different. Different from a lot of guys I've met. I like it. Time is a more unstable element once inside a memory. You've probably had the experience of sleeping for an hour, yet feeling like you've only been sleeping for a few minutes once you wake up. Time inside of a memory projection can behave much the same way, but in reverse. In theory, of course. This takes place largely due to the lowered brain function within REM sleep, as we've previously discussed. The higher the brain activity, the greater the ability to achieve longer periods of time within a memory even spending as much as a week or more within a memory in just a few hours of real time. I'll pass it off to the professor from here to explain more. Jacob's eyes never left Zoe during her presentation, and it was the suddenness of the applause that broke him out of the days he'd been in. He was rather impressed with her presentation, as he never knew how much there was to horology, even after they had spoken about it several times. Before the class grew silent again, Zoe made her way back to her seat next to Dean a couple of tables down from him, he glanced over at them, staring at them for a moment before the professor made his way to the front of the class. Zoe's presentation leads us to today's topic, the subjectiveness of time within REM sleep. Recorded theories state that it is possible to move through up to three days worth of dream time and only one hour's worth of real time. In South Africa, a recent study was conducted where a female subject was given a medically induced coma after a tragic accident. The woman was reported to have been in the coma for approximately five months, and afterwards she experienced something that had never been recorded in an experiment before. While she was in the coma, she had experienced her entire college life through her dreams. She recounted everything in precise detail over the several years that had passed in her dream time, from simple things such as who her friends were and what classes she took, to more unusual things such as her exact grades, where her dorm was, and the job she had. There were varying degrees of information that she provided, some of it proven to be in some ways accurate and other information that seemed like her mind had fabricated it for the purpose of the dreams. Jacob looked back at Dean and Zoe, seeing that they were quietly talking to each other. He watched for several minutes and was caught off guard when Zoe flicked her head in his direction. Seeing the large grin on Zoe's face, he put two and two together and realized that Dean was actually following through with his promise to ask her out for him. His cheeks flared up instantly, turning red. He forced his eyes away from both of them, but he only lasted a second or so before he looked back again. Zoe looked back at Jacob and motioned for him to come over to her just as the lecture ended. He got up and moved toward her, but he wasn't surprised when it was Dean who spoke instead of her. It took a few minutes for Dean to get to the point, but eventually he explained the plan that he and Zoe discussed. Plans had been made for the three of them to go out and enjoy the evening together. Dean insisted that the three of them go to his favorite student lounge on the other side of campus. Neither Zoe or Jacob had much of a reason to decline. Later that evening, when all three of them had arrived, the place was somewhat busy. 
with wall-to-wall -wall students hanging out in the area. They walked into the bar, which was even more crowded than the lounge itself, and they had difficulties finding seats for the three of them. Eventually, they found an open bar stool, just one, but it was a start. Dean claimed it quickly, but instead of taking it for himself, he motioned for Zoe to sit. Why, thank you, sir. Dean and Jacob looked at each other and laughed. Dean immediately began checking out the bartenders, making sure the one he knew was not particular about checking IDs was on shift that night. Eventually, he spotted the one he was looking for and waved him over. Hey, grab us some beers, would you? Minutes later, the three of them had their own chilled glass of beer. This is going to be a great night. Later on in the night, Dean excused himself to head to the restroom. Jacob stood awkwardly near Zoe, the two of them remaining silent. Eventually, she turned away to order another drink, and Jacob looked away from her to look at something else that caught his attention. As he did, a large guy squeezed in beside him, moving between him and Zoe. Hey, so I don't have any clever one-liners to use on you tonight, so I'll just get to the point. The man slurred, obviously quite drunk, and reached toward Zoe to place his hand on her thigh. Jacob could barely see her with the man in the way, but from what he could tell, she looked uncomfortable. Zoe immediately brushed the guy's hand away from her, which only provoked him. Oh, check this out. So we've got a feisty one here, huh? He chuckled drunkenly, grabbing Zoe by the arm with his chubby hand. Jacob froze as he took the scene in, especially considering the size difference between them. Why don't you just back off, moozer? Jacob said sternly, grabbing the man's arm and pulling him off of Zoe. While the move immediately struck him as a bad one, he knew he had to do something. Jacob's body jerked as a brutal punch connected with his face, sending him soaring through the air before crashing onto the unforgiving floor. His head hit with a sickening thud, causing stars to dance in front of his eyes and blood to trickle from his nose. The pain was excruciating, but it was nothing compared to the rage boiling inside of him as he struggled to get up. With a growl, he lunged at the guy who dared to touch Zoe, but strong hands held him back. Zoe's horrified screams filled his ears as she rushed over frantically trying to tend to his injuries. But all Jacob could see was red, his fists clenching and unclenching in a primal urge for revenge. When the bouncers finally dragged the aggressor away, Jacob slumped to the ground panting and shaking with adrenaline. Dean appeared by his side. The three of them went back to the bar, chairs available for all three of them now, where Jacob recalled his story. Dean only shrugged and shook his head, hoping that the altercation hadn't ruined Jacob's chances with Zoe. There was an awkward silence for several moments. It took another round of drinks before Dean finally spoke up again. Either of you guys planning on going to the next football game? Hadn't planned on it. Zoe looked at him, concerned, but said nothing seeing that Jacob seemed to be okay. I think I might go. You, Dean? Well, yeah. Why else would I be asking? I guess that means you're still single if you're asking us, huh? So are you. Hey, how about that? Jacob here is too. Maybe you two could- Whoa, 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 hold it. How would you know that? Yeah, Dean. I'm wondering the same thing. Oh, brother. Never mind. I guess I don't have a clue. The three of them laughed a little more, told a few stories, and had a good time. They all had more than their share of drinks, which opened the floodgates of conversation. Even random things like the color of the carpet in their childhood homes. But none of them seemed to mind at all. It wasn't long before they got to deeper topics that were a bit more serious. Jacob was a little more than tipsy when he tried to navigate back to his dorm. He was still somewhat upset about the encounter in the bar where he'd ended up with a bloody nose, and at the moment he was seriously considering the options he had for doing something about it. He was almost at his dorm when an old memory popped into his mind. It was a memory that he'd thought about every now and then throughout the years, usually after situations such as what had happened that night. The memory was one from elementary school, and though he was a lot younger, it definitely shaped who he was. The memory was clear in his mind. It happened near the end of the school year, and he'd managed to get on the bad side of the school's bully. Jacob did what he could to remedy the problem, but the bully wasn't having any of it. In the end, the bully decided that he'd threatened Jacob to get what he wanted. The conflict ended with Jacob getting badly beaten after school in front of a crowd of students. He was enraged because his thoughts simmered on the memory. It crossed his mind several times over that he could do something about it. He had to do something about it. There were many ways he could solve how he felt at the moment, 
but the only solution he wanted to try was going back and altering the event that bothered him. His plan was simple. Go back to that day in elementary school and make sure he didn't get beat up. If that never happened, he'd be a different guy. I should have just broken that guy's face. He paused for a while, leaning against the wall outside the nearby building. After taking a few minutes to collect himself, he changed courses from his dorm and headed toward the lab. It's not too late, he muttered under his breath, becoming more solid in his resolve on the way there. The lights inside the lab were already on when he finally arrived, but the door was locked. He tugged on the door in frustration, but it was useless. He dashed through the alley and went around the back of the class, climbing up on a brick wall. There were two other students inside. He would just have to wait and try to keep from falling asleep in the process. He walked back to the classroom's entrance and stood near the door, trying to quell the impatience that grew as a side effect of his drunkenness. Soon he decided that he was too tired to stand and slid against the wall to sit on the ground. His head pounded, and he reluctantly moved to rest it in his hands. Even after quite some time had passed with Jacob sitting on the floor outside the lab, the students inside didn't seem to have any intention of leaving any time soon. Jacob picked himself up from the floor and sauntered off toward the building's lobby. He sat down in one of the chairs near the hallway that led to the lab, at that moment not too keen or moving about. He had practically passed out by the time he heard the double doors in the hallway swing open. He lifted his head in confusion at the noise, as he hadn't realized he'd fallen asleep. He peeled himself from the couch and dashed for the doors in time to see the students coming out. You okay, bro? You don't look so good. Yeah, had a little too much. You know how it is. Just a headache, though. I'm good. Uh-oh. I see a wicked hangover coming tomorrow. The student patted Jacob's shoulder as he left. The short conversation has somewhat cleared Jacob's head. He waited several more minutes for the student to get further down the hallway before going into the lab, making sure that the other student had no intention of coming back to the lab. He backed into the lab and turned to face the projection equipment. He was on a mission and was more eager this time than the last time. He set the dawn simulator and strapped in. Sleep came to Jacob much easier than it had in his last use of the machine. He was more excited this time, but he was also drunk and exhausted. He was heading to a highly emotional place in his mind, and he felt the fear and anger that surrounded it as his mind guided him back to the school where it happened. He awoke in the elementary school's yard, the same school from the previous projection, only this time he was a bit older. When he came to, it didn't quite make any sense to him why he was outside of the school, as classes were still in session. While walking toward a small courtyard, he realized what was actually going on. One of the school's side doors opened, and it was his younger self who walked out. Jacob watched for a moment as his younger self kicked at a metal railing near the stairs, and then sat down, holding his head in his palms. He walked over to his younger self, trying to remain casual. His younger self looked up at him with further projected fear as he approached, unsure of his purpose. Jacob said nothing at first, just standing in front of the kid before moving to sit next to him on the stairs. Without looking at his younger self, he spoke. You know, you don't have to be afraid of this guy, Jacob. He's nothing. But you can't be scared. You can't let him think you're scared. His younger self turned his head to look at Jacob with a confused look. Easy for you to say. No. Hey, look at me. Hit him before he hits you and he'll go down like the baby he is. Trust me. Are you crazy? That's a stupid idea. I can't. The school bell rang a loud chime. He saw the fear return inside his younger self's eyes, the familiar terror, the terror that he too had felt. The boy fidgeted uncomfortably in his seat. You better not run. You hit him or I'll hit you. You choose. His younger self now looked up at him with fearful eyes, and Jacob thought that perhaps his little threat stirred something inside him. The other kids made an incoherent racket as they came around the school, anticipating the fight about to happen. Jacob's younger self remained seated on the stairs, his hands whitening as his grip tightened on the railing, just as his fear gripped him from within, its hold strengthening with each passing second. Remember, it's him or me. His younger self looked up at him again, still in the grips of fear, as he saw the bully coming to join the crowd of children outside. The younger Jacob stood up from the stairs and trained his eyes on the bully. His hands twisted into fists as he stepped forward, not giving the older Jacob another look. He didn't hesitate but he closed his eyes when he felt his fist shoot forward. His fist connected with the bully's face. In tune with the gasp of the crowd, the bully was sent sprawling to the scene. 
No one had expected Jacob to be the one to throw the first punch, and they all stood and stared silently as the adrenaline that surged through Jacob took over, leading him to punch the bully over and over again. Jacob watched his younger self in amazement. He didn't expect him to make a move, but of course he was glad he did. The scene of his younger self punching the bully until he finally gave in was surreal. Young Jacob stood looking down at the bully panting as the fury and adrenaline began to leave him. The kids around them broke the silence and cheered, but older Jacob knew that he and his younger self had to get out of there. See? I told you. Now come on, we gotta get out of here before you get in trouble. Which was enough to convince his younger self to get moving. They cut across the school's soccer field and playground, running off to a secluded path that Jacob knew too well. It was the only one nearby that led in the direction of his foster parents' house. Once they were a fair distance away from the school and even further down the trail, the pair slowed to a walk while they caught their breath. <laughs> but were you really going to hit me? No, of course not. I'm sorry for even saying that I would. It's okay. But how'd you know I was going to fight today? Jacob leaned down, ruffling his younger self's hair, trying to come up with a response that would make sense, but chose to evade the question altogether. I doubt that guy or anyone else will bother you anymore. A sense of pride filled him as he saw the determination in his younger self's eyes. Hey, what do you think about working out? If you keep your body strong, you won't find so many people trying to mess with you. I guess I could. Give it some thought, and try it out when you get a bit older. You won't have to spend all of your time exercising, just a little less of the video games. Think about it, all right? His younger self stopped with Jacob as they came to the front of their house. You never told me who you are. Don't worry about me, kid. I'm just here to help. Jacob gave him another smile, then ruffled his hair again. And you should probably keep all of this stuff a secret. Go ahead inside. The younger Jacob gave him a confused smile, but he wasn't ready to leave yet. Jacob watched his younger self go inside, curious, concerned, and happy. As Jacob turned to walk away, his younger self burst through the front door once more. Hey, wait. And Jacob turned and waited as his younger self darted towards him. Here, it's all I have. His younger self had given him a quarter. Oh, I can't take your... You have to. Mom says when people do good stuff for you, you have to show credit. Um, gr grat, you have to show them that you appreciate what they did. That was, in fact, his foster mother saying. Jacob smiled and put the coin in his pocket. You mean you have to show gratitude. You're right. Thanks, kid. He turned and left to wander the city and contemplate whether this little experiment would be a success or not. As he waited for the bright light of the dawn simulator to sweep across his face, waking him back to the present. Jacob woke up feeling a strange mix of emotions. On one hand, he felt physically stronger and more confident, but on the other hand, he couldn't shake off the uneasiness in his stomach. As he pulled up his sleeve and saw his muscles, he couldn't help but question how it all came to be. And then the coin. He'd almost forgotten about it amidst all the chaos of the previous night. But as he reached into his pocket, he couldn't believe that it was still there, somehow transported from the past to the present. It was a reminder of everything that had happened and everything that he still didn't understand. Before starting his day, he quickly made some notes in his journal, trying to make sense of it all. But as he flipped through the pages, he realized there was still so much left unanswered from that fateful night. As Jacob's journey through time unfolds, we bid farewell to another captivating episode of the Actuality Podcast. In this installment, we witness Jacob's courage and determination as he ventured into the depths of his own past, wielding the power of the projection machine to rewrite history. Join us next time as Jacob continues to embark on a quest of self-discovery that will test the limits of his courage and conviction. Until then, remember that every choice we make has the power to shape who we are for the future. Stay tuned for more thrilling adventures and profound revelations on the Actuality Podcast.